spring 1862, a Prussian diplomat in Paris receives a telegram. Periculum in Morat. Dépêchez-vous. Danger and delay. Make haste. In the Kingdom of Prussia, a great crisis had taken hold. The Conservatives, the Crown and the ever-growing Liberal parliamentarians were locked in an endless conflict with no end in sight. The source of this strife was a crucial issue, military budgetary spending and reforms. As tensions rose and tempers flared, the Liberals began to radicalise, driven by a fierce determination to achieve their goals at any cost. By the time spring arrived, an incredible 230 of the 325 deputies were firmly aligned with Liberal factions. But the Crown was not content to sit idly by and watch the Liberals seize power. In a bold and daring move, the King dissolved the Parliament and issued re-elections multiple times, hoping to break the hold of the Liberals and restore order to the Kingdom. Yet, to his surprise, each time the elections were held, the Liberals emerged even stronger than before. Their numbers bolstered by new supporters and their resolve hardened by the struggle. The fires of unrest continued to rage unabated among the politically inflexible conservative faction, their voices growing ever louder in their desperate desire to break free from the constraints of the constitutional system. But the king, determined to preserve the stability and integrity of the kingdom, refused to be swayed by their fervent pleas. Rather than return to the days of absolutism, he proposed to abdicate in favour of his liberal-minded son, the illustrious Crown Prince Frederick. It was a pivotal moment in the history of Prussia, one that would be forever etched into the annals of time, and it was the Minister of War, Albrecht von Rohn, who played a key role in shaping the course of events to come. Summoning the Prussian diplomat stationed in Paris with a swift and decisive telegram, he set in motion a chain of events that would forever alter the destiny of the kingdom. For the diplomat, it was the moment he had been waiting for. His finest hour had come, and with it, the finest hour of the kingdom of Prussia. He returned to Berlin with a sense of purpose and determination, ready to take up his duties and do his part. And so it was that Otto von Bismarck stepped onto the stage, a towering figure of history. He would guide Prussia through 11 turbulent years, which would culminate in the unification of Germany. Bismarck would forge a new nation-state from the ashes of the old. His tenure and legacy are among the undisputed epics of history. Politics is no science, it is an art, and anyone without the knack for it should leave it alone. Otto von Bismarck. For nearly half a century after the crushing downfall of Napoleon and the renowned Congress of Vienna, Prussia sat idly by on the periphery of European power politics, content to steer its course in the shadow of greater nations, sidestepping and shying away from the tumult of conflict. With care, it maneuvered to avoid incensing its formidable neighbors, bowing before Russian dominion over its foreign policy. Prussia was the sole major European power that remained neutral during the turbulent Crimean War. To some, the once proud kingdom seemed anachronistic. Its status as a member of the great European powers concert rendered obsolete. However, all was about to change in a blaze of political and military energy that would astound Europe. In 1859, the Second Italian War of Independence cast light on the urgent need for military reform in the Prussian army. It was time to ready themselves for the challenges that lay ahead. The call for military reform was led by the new regent, Prince William of Prussia, an illustrious man already 61 years of age, deputising for his older brother, incapacitated by a series of debilitating strokes. During this era, there was much heated debate regarding the unification of German-speaking territories. While serving as military governor in the Rhineland in 1849, 
William nurtured relationships with like-minded small German liberal activists who advocated for a Prussian-led union. This small German solution stood in sharp contrast to the large German alternative that would have cemented Austria's dominance as the largest and most potent German state of the early 19th century. In the stirring days of autumn in 1862, Bismarck strode into the halls of power in Berlin, assuming the post of minister-president. He set out to forge an understanding with the majority of deputies, preserving the crown's power and the army's excellence, as he penned in a missive to the crown prince. Yet no compromise was forthcoming. Instead, Bismarck launched sweeping military reforms, defied parliamentary authority to collect taxes, and warned civil servants that disobedience and political engagement with the opposition would be met with swift dismissal. In September, during his inaugural appearance before the Budget Committee, Bismarck declared that the moment had arrived to utilize the Prussian army to settle the German question once and for all, with a resounding call for blood and iron. This now famous phrase became the hallmark of his illustrious career. Parliamentarians were left seething, this move swiftly established him as the preeminent figure of influence over the monarch, eclipsing all rivals. In Berlin, the ominous shadow of international political inaction was threatening to shatter Prussia's grip on the German question. While Bismarck grappled with stonewalling the chamber in 1863, the Austrians were already forging ahead with their own reforms, which promised to reinvigorate the German confederation. The Prussian minister-president's achievements in foreign policy seemed meager, to say the least. He succeeded only in blocking Vienna's reform project and continued to rebuff its overtures to join the German customs union. His tenure appeared tenuous at best, and his dismissal seemed inevitable in the face of parliamentary resistance. However, a war was on the brink of breaking out. This Danish War of 1864 would be the crucible that transformed Bismarck's fortunes. Only three people have ever understood the Schleswig-Holstein question. One is dead, one has gone mad, and I have forgotten. Lord Palmerston. On November 15th, 1863, Frederick VII of Denmark breathed his last breath, plunging the land into a crisis. With no direct male heir to claim the throne, a fierce dispute erupted over who held the legitimate hereditary right to rule over the duchies. In the early 1850s, a series of international treaties had been forged, ensuring that the new King of Denmark, Christian of Glücksburg, would ascend the throne on the same terms as his predecessor. However, in 1863, the situation was thrown into disarray when a rival claimant emerged, Prince Frederick of Augustenburg. The Augustenburgs had long held a claim to the duchies, but Prince Frederick's father had relinquished this claim as part of the Treaty of London in 1852. The once clear waters of succession were now murky and fraught with tension. In 1863, Frederick of Augustenburg made a daring declaration that he was no longer bound by the Treaty of 1852. With unwavering defiance, he boldly proclaimed himself as the Duke of Schleswig-Holstein. His call was like a beacon to the German nationalist movement, who rallied to his cause with fervor and zeal. Meanwhile, the new inexperienced king, Christian IX, ascended to the throne. He was faced with a volatile and explosive domestic situation as German and Danish nationalist sentiments clashed in a bitter struggle. The people were divided, and the kingdom teetered on the brink of chaos. The newly crowned monarch became increasingly worried as he contemplated the prospect of political unrest. Then, he made a bold move, signing the November Constitution of 1863, which aimed to integrate the Duchy of Schleswig into the Danish unitary state. However, this noble act was met with scorn by German nationalists, who regarded it as a most grievous affront. The Austrians and Prussians, staunch opponents of the Augustenburg claim, vehemently opposed Denmark's decision, insisting that they abide by the terms of the Treaty of 1852. 
In December, the Confederal Diet witnessed an intense exchange of words and negotiations as the parties involved attempted to reach a compromise. After much heated discourse, a resolution was finally passed, albeit by a single vote, which authorized an intervention based on the London Treaties. The dawn of the 23rd of December, 1863, saw a contingent of the German Confederation's troops crossing the Danish frontier, their sights set on the subjugation of Holstein south of the mighty river Ida. The 12,000 strong army effortlessly occupied the undefended land of Holstein. The prize that lay ahead was Schleswig, fiercely defended by the Danish forces. A much greater force was needed to ensure success. Undeterred, the powers of Prussia and Austria acted forward in unison, announcing their readiness to invade Schleswig, but only in their capacity as European powers, not as representatives of the German Confederation, and strictly on the basis of the Treaty of 1852, not in support of the Augustenburg claim. In a show of force, the Allied army, under the leadership of the venerable Field Marshal Friedrich von Wrangel, descended upon Schleswig on the 1st of February, 1864. Their advance across the Eider was met with fierce opposition from the Danish forces. The following morning saw the beginning of a violent clash as a Prussian vanguard engaged the Danish forces at Mysunda. Mysunda stood as a small, humble fishing village, comprising a mere two dozen houses, situated on the southern banks of the Schlei. It formed a crucial part of the eastern fortifications of the great Danaverke, a system of Danish fortifications. Yet its true significance lay in the narrowness of the Schlei at this very point. This rendered Mysunda one of the few places where the eastern flank of Danavirka was not shielded by natural barriers, making it an important strategic location. As the sun rose, the 10,000-strong Prussian First Corps, led by Prince Friedrich Karl of Prussia, began its march towards the Danish stronghold at Koschendorf. Yet, as the morning wore on, it became clear that the Danish forces had no intention of standing their ground and defending Kokendor, for they had retreated to the north. The Prussian vanguard quickly swept through the village, seizing it with ease and paving the way for their next assault. The decision was made to push on and capture Mysunda. As three brigades remained in reserve, the rest of the corps pushed forward, marching towards their ultimate goal. By the stroke of ten, the 1st Fusilier Battalion, commanded by Major von Krohn, had come within sight of the Danish positions. The Danish position at Mysunda was a formidable sight to behold, a series of bastions encircling the village like a ring of steel. At the heart of this impregnable fortress were the two most important bastions, known simply as A and B, positioned on either side of the southern road leading into the village. Captain Hertel commanded the 6th Fortification Battalion. With 20 cannons and around 100 brave men at his disposal, Hertel was ready to face any foe. The 1st Battalion of the 18th Regiment, no less valiant, stood steadfast by his side. Bastion A was armed with four 24-pounders and four 12-pounders, while Bastion B boasted four 24-pounders and two 12-pounders. The Danish artillery, however, was no match for the Prussian guns, which were more advanced, more precise, and more deadly. The 3rd Brigade was bivouacked 11 kilometers to the north of Mysunda, waiting patiently in reserve. The Prussian vanguard was comprised of the Fusilier battalions of the 13th, 15th, and 24th Regiment, as well as the 1st Battalion of the 60th Regiment and the fearsome Westphalian Rifle Battalion. The advance faced a Danish outpost near the Longacy around 10.30 in the morning. A short but fierce battle ensued, with the Danes putting up a stubborn resistance, but the Prussians proved to be too much for them to handle. 
and the Danes were forced to retreat back towards Misunda. In the midst of a dense fog, the Prussian advance upon Misunda was cloaked in secrecy. The bastions surrounding the village remained eerily silent as the enemy drew near. But this stillness was not to last. At 11.30, the arrival of the 1st Battalion of the 3rd Danish Regiment under the command of Captain Arntz shook the Prussian troops. Alongside a squadron of dragoons, the Danish force ventured forth on a reconnaissance mission in front of the bastions. They were met with a hail of fire from the Fusilier battalions of the 15th and 24th Prussian regiments. The air was thick with the stench of gunpowder and the screams of the wounded and dying filled the air. Major von Krohn led the Fusilier battalion in a bayonet charge that forced the Danish infantry to retreat. Captain Arntz, his forces decimated and his officers killed or wounded, ordered his battalion to take position at the bastions. It was at this moment that the Danish commanders realized that the Prussians were not simply on a reconnaissance mission, but had launched a full-scale assault upon the fortifications. The Prussian fusiliers charged forth. They swiftly advanced, occupying the right flank and seizing the fence, which lay a mere hundred meters from Bastion B. They also took up positions of cover, approximately 250 meters from the heart of the Danish stronghold. The ensuing battle was nothing short of a fierce contest, with both sides exchanging fire without the protection of sturdy trenches. Danish soldiers were forced to lie on the frozen ground, firing back at the Prussians in a desperate attempt to stop them. Around noon, the Prussian artillery arrived at Misunda, deploying on a ridge in front of the Danish position. A battery of 24 six-pound cannon and 24 howitzers opened fire on the bastions at 12.45, followed shortly after by 16 more guns from the reserve artillery. The Prussian command hoped to overwhelm the Danish fortification troops with their superior firepower. The battlefield erupted into a cacophony of sound as the furious artillery duel raged on between the Danish bastions and the Prussian ridges. The 20 Danish cannons unleashed a barrage of fire, but the Prussian artillery responded in kind with 64 cannons. The dense fog obscured the battlefield, making it impossible for either side to distinguish their targets. Despite the thick fog, the flashes of cannon fire illuminated the battlefield. The Prussian infantry, entrenched in their positions, mercilessly picked off Danish artillerymen, causing a catastrophic loss of life, particularly in the exposed Bastion B. Though the Danish 3rd Brigade had been ordered to reinforce Misunda when the Prussian artillery opened fire, they were too far away to provide immediate assistance. In desperation, two companies of the 2nd Battalion of the 3rd Regiment, stationed on the coast to the northeast of the village, were hastily deployed southward. Meanwhile, the 10th Battery of the Danish Army had arrived at noon and taken up a position on the western banks of the Schlei. In an attempt to quell the unrelenting fire on Bastion B, a brave company of the 18th Regiment charged forward, intent on driving back the Prussian fusiliers entrenched behind the fences in front of the Bastion. However, their courage was met with a hail of bullets from the Prussian positions, and they were forced to retreat. Though the Danes put up a fierce resistance, their cannons firing relentlessly upon the Prussians, three of their own cannons were destroyed. The majority of the Prussian shells missed the Danish positions and hit the village instead, causing numerous buildings to catch fire. Despite the intense fire, the Prussian infantry attempted multiple assaults across the open terrain, only to be met with a barrage of canister shot and enfilade fire from the Danish bastions. The Prussian howitzers were particularly vulnerable and suffered heavy losses in their exposed positions. Despite making some gains on the right flank of the Danish position, the Prussians were once again driven back by the steadfast musket fire of the Danish infantry. At the height of the battle, the Danish army braced themselves for the impending Prussian assault. Two guns were hastily redeployed 
to cover the central road into Misunden, and the Danish infantry stood ready to meet the Prussians with bayonets fixed, determined to defend their position until the bitter end. But just as the tension reached its peak, the Prussians surprised everyone by deciding to withdraw. It was clear that victory could only be achieved through a costly and bloody frontal assault on the Danish fortifications. While the Prussian forces held the numerical advantage, the prospect of heavy casualties was unacceptable to their high command. And so, as the sun began to set on the battlefield, the Prussian forces slowly began to pull back, leaving behind the smoldering ruins of the village of Misunde as a stark reminder of the fierce battle that had taken place there. The battle between the Danish and Prussian armies had taken its toll with bloodshed and loss on both sides. The Danes had suffered a total of 141 casualties, including nine officers and 132 enlisted men. The Prussian army had also paid a heavy price for their aggression. With 12 officers and 187 enlisted men falling in battle. The most significant losses were in the Fusilier Battalion of the 15th Regiment, with 60 dead, followed by the 2nd Battalion of the 60th Regiment, which had lost 40 soldiers. Despite their losses and frankly their defeat, the Prussian infantry and artillery were highly regarded for their remarkable performance on the battlefield. The conflict, indeed, marked a critical moment as it was the first examination of the new Prussian army following the reforms. The triumph of the Danish army at Mysunda was of great significance as it prevented the entrapment and encirclement of the Danish army at Danewerke. But the war had only just begun. The following day, Austria faced a Danish army at Königshügel. It would be a fierce clash between one of Europe's mightiest empires and the outnumbered Danes. Thank you very much for watching this video. Please leave a like, it really helps out the channel. If there is a topic, battle or person you would like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in a comment. I would also like to thank all my patrons and channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and you want to support my work, consider joining me on Patreon. For just $1 per month, you will already gain early access to all my videos without any in-video advertisements. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.